Welcome back to the Level 2 National Curriculum Tutorials. Session 2 covers mortise and tenons. Your instructor for this session is Becky Schimpf. For Level 2, we need to create for the frame of the grill two L-shaped pieces that have square corners. But for to put that frame together, we need to put a tenon on one end and a mortise on the other and then join it together. So we did some mortise and tenon joinery if you did level one to put together that farm gate latch. For level two, uh, we're raising the bar a little bit. Uh, let's just talk about what mortise and tenon joinery is and uh, why it's useful. So it's the strongest of the blacksmith joinery techniques. The reason for that is that when you put a uh, mortise and tenon together, the tenon shrinks around the mortise, creating a really strong, stable joint. Uh, so it's traditionally used where strong, stable joints are required, such as architectural applications, gates and railings, and also in furniture. And just my little pitch here is adding mortise and tenon joinery can greatly expand your repertoire of things that you can make because suddenly you can join things together where you couldn't before. All right, so uh, what's new to level two is forging tenons on flat bar. Uh, and so I'm going to do a little bit of a deep dive into tenons because this is something of really important consideration. You don't really see the tenon, but you really need it to function. Uh, so let's talk about what we need in a successful tenon. Uh, so first of all, we need clean uh, square shoulders, as you see in this uh, photo here. That's so that it fits nicely. We want our tenon to be just slightly smaller in diameter than our bar is thick. And I'll just uh, say here for the level two frame, uh, we're required to bake that frame out of three eighths of an inch by three quarters inch stock. And so that's what we're working with here. So this tenon is 5 16 in diameter. So just smaller than that three eighths of an inch thickness. And the reason for that is so that we don't see our mortise when we assemble the mortise and tenon. We also need the tenon to be centered on our bar. That maybe goes without saying, but if it's not centered, our mortise and our tenon won't line up correctly. This is the big one, and I'll spend a lot of time talking about how to avoid these. We don't want cold shuts or cracking. What happens commonly in tenons is you get a cold shut or a crack at the base of the tenon right here, at the root of the tenon, and that can lead to failure uh, during assembly which if you put a lot of time into making something, you definitely don't want to have happen. Next, we'd like to have a slight chamfer at the root. That's right here. And that goes a long way to prevent cracking because we don't have anything sharp cutting into that shoulder. And that's really a function of our tools using rounded tools and a chamfered monkey tool. And I'll talk about that. Last but not least, we need sufficient tenon length for whatever our application is. Okay, so for materials and tools for this, we're working with three eighths of an inch by three quarters inch flat bar because that's what's required for the level two grill. We need a hammer. We need some sort of ruler or measuring device. And here I've written smush matic or guillotine or tools of your choice. And the reason I've written this is um, that there are many ways to make a tenon. Uh, I'd like to make a pitch that for level two, that you use some sort of guillotine. Uh, a smush matic is a guillotine that's designed specifically for making tenons, and I'll talk about how to make one later on in this presentation. But there are many ways to make a tenon. So we're doing two things. One is we need to butcher in the end of the bar to create that shoulder and isolate the material that will become the tenon. And for that, you can use, you can use a guillotine type tool. You can use the um, handheld butcher that we created in level one. You can use a hardy butcher. You can use match top and bottom tools. You could use a fuller with a uh, bent piece of bar that matches it to uh, butcher in that, um, that shoulder and isolate the mass. For drawing out the tenon, again, you could use flat dies in a guillotine or smush matic You could use a set hammer. The only method I don't recommend is using the edge of your anvil simply because you run the risk of damaging your shoulder. You need a monkey tool. And for this, we need the monkey tool to be sized to 5 16 of an inch and a hot rasp in case you need to uh, clean up your shoulder or take out any mishits. Okay, so where to start? So we need to consider the desired length of our uh, tenon. What kind of tenon do we want? Uh, what's it doing? What's it going through? Do we want it to be rounded? Do we want it to be flush? 
the second consideration we have is to we, we need to talk about peeling. So if you look at this photo on the left here, you can see that we're using a butcher close to the end of the bar and it's causing the bar to peel. And if we then go to try to draw that out into a tenon, it will fold onto itself. We won't be successful in making a tenon. So to prevent that, as you can see here in this photo on the right, if we come back half the height of the bar, then it doesn't peel. We have a nice, uh, we're butchering in nicely there and we can then draw that out. The rule of thumb for this is to measure back at least half the height of the bar. Our bar is three eighths of an inch by three quarters of an inch. So height for our purposes is three quarters of an inch. So you wanna come in at least three eighths of an inch, maybe half an inch to make sure that you don't have peeling there. And I'll just say right now that if you're doing the level two grill, that is more than sufficient length for either a rounded or a flush tenon head. So you don't need to actually do any calculations to get that number. You don't need to do it for level two, but if you need to work closer to the end of the bar, one option is to heavily chamfer the end. If you take off those corners at the end, then you can come in closer to the end with your butcher. The second consideration before we start is that we need to upset our material at the end of the bar to counteract the effect of pulling in. So what's pulling in? So if you look at this red arrow here, you can see that uh, when we butchered this shoulder, pulled the shoulder into um, where we're isolating the material. So we have this curve here. And you can also see that this bar has been upset. This dotted line shows the parent stock, the original parent stock. And you can see that it's been upset. Um, this is three quarters of an inch bar. So that might be a 16th an inch, maybe a little bit more than that. So that this bar has been upset by about an eighth or maybe three sixteenths of an inch. And because of that, we can come back at the end and dress that shoulder to correct for that pulling in. We're counteracting that pulling in. So our first step is to upset the bar. And I will show some videos of these as we go. Um, I'll show the slides first, then the videos. So our first step is to chamfer the end to focus the upset. And again, this is because we want our upset to be where the tenon will be, which again is about half the height of the bar back. So we want it to be around here. So if we chamfer the end, that helps us to focus that upset where we want it to go. Our second step after we chamfer is to upset the bar on the anvil or in the vise. So let's talk about upsetting for a minute. So again, we want this area here to be upset. So if you're using a propane forge, you may need to do some strategic quenching up the end of the bar. Um, if you have too long of a heat in your bar, the way that upsetting works is that the, uh, the force of the hammer blow will go to wherever you have heat. So you'll end up just bending your bar instead of upsetting it. So upset the bar on the anvil or in the vise. Uh, whenever you're upsetting, use light, rapid hammer blows. And this is what we're aiming for here. And then once you have that upset, uh, address all four sides. And then I've written taking the time to upset now will save you from an upsetting experience later. And that is true. Okay, so let's watch a video of this step. And uh, so we're chamfering the end of the bar here. Uh, be sure to dress it back to parent stock thickness. We don't want it um, to get thicker. Um, and then once we've dressed it back, upset the bar. Um, you can see that the, the heat is concentrated at the end of the bar here. We don't have heat going up uh, and even so it is bending a little bit. Um, and that's about all you need to do to upset. Uh, again, uh, there we go. That's about what we're looking for here. Okay, so our next consideration is that we want to prevent cold shuts and cracks. Uh, so we, we want to keep the edges of our tools rounded and looks, let's look at why. So here we see we have, these are the smush matic dies and you can see the butcher dies are well rounded. This is maybe three sixteenths of an inch here in uh, radius. And when we butcher in the shoulder, you can see it gives a nice radius to that shoulder. Now in the end, we want a clean square shoulder. But making that clean square shoulder is the function of the monkey tool. At this point, what we want is that rounded edge. 
And that is so that nothing sharp is cutting in or setting up the possibility of cracks in our shoulder at the root of that tenon. There's a secondary advantage to this, which is that when we come in with our next tool, that valley that we've created, our rounded tool, gives a place for our next tool to come in. We don't have to get all the way to the shoulder. Our tool can come in right in that valley and drop that tenon. Now let's look at this uh, center photo. So here we have a, a somewhat sharp, hardy butcher, and you can see that it's creating a really sharp edge there. So yes, our shoulder is square. That's what we want in the end, but at the danger of cracking because we've set up this very sharp corner here. And we'll have the secondary problem when we come in with our tool to draw out the tenon is that the tool can't get close enough to that shoulder. And when we draw it out, there'll be a, a hump right here that when we go back and dress it with the monkey tool, it will fold over. Looking at this bottom photo here, um, no on the sharp tools, yes on the rounded tools. Okay, so our first step is to butcher in the shoulder. So we've upset the bar and we're coming back at least half the height of the bar. And here it looks like we're coming back about half an inch. And here we're using a guillotine style tool. This is a smushomatic with well-rounded dies. Again, you can use other options. You can use a handheld butcher. Uh, you can use a hardy butcher. You can use a top and bottom set. Whatever tool you use, make sure those edges are rounded. Okay, some two very important points. Uh, be sure to hold your stock perpendicular. If it's not perpendicular, your shoulder will not be perpendicular. Flip it often, this is also really critical. So when you're hammering from above, the force of your hammer blow, the physics of it, is that the physics, the, the hammer blow from above is stronger than the hammer blow from below. Uh, and so what you'll have is a greater indentation from the top than from the bottom, and that will make your tenon off center. Turn it every two hits, and that will accommodate the difference in the force of the blow from the top and the bottom. And also as you go, watch your heat, because if you've hit on the top, for example, and then flipped your bar and you're losing heat, you may not be forging as deeply as you're losing heat. Uh, so keep an eye on that. Dress the growth on the sides as you work. You, want your, you don't want your tenon to be thicker than the bar. Here's a key point, don't butcher too deeply. What do I mean by that? So if we butcher too deeply at this point, we can't recover from that. Your tenon will be too thin. So stop shy of where you're going. And the easiest way to do that is to work backwards. We know that uh, in order to make our 5 16 round, uh, we'll first make a 3 8 of an inch square. This is 3 8 of an inch thick bar. Doing square octagon round, we'll start with that 3 8 of an inch square. So stop before you get to that 3 8 of an inch square. Okay, use a hot rasp to clean up any mishits. So something that happens sometimes with using these tools is that it jumps, especially in the beginning. And that can get deeper as you continue to forge and those can turn into, um, into cracks. So be sure to clean those up with a rasp as you go. Um, I would also note that if you used a chisel or a file to mark where you wanted to start your tenon, the same thing, but that chisel mark or a center punch mark will travel deeper. So be sure to file that out. Okay, so now let's watch a video of the butchering. <laughs> Uh, again, hold it parallel, come back half the height of the bar, uh, hit it twice on one side, then flip and turn it over. And this will keep your forging even. Uh, it's off screen, but come back and uh, dress back to parent stock thickness uh, and continue working uh, until you've reached your depth. And uh, I can pause it right there. You can see that we're stopping short of that 3 8 of an inch uh, square. The next tool will bring us to that 3 8 of an inch. So we don't need to get that all the way to that depth at this point. Okay, so our next step is to draw down the area we just isolated to create our tenon. And here we're using um, flat dies. Note again, that very well-rounded corners, there's nothing sharp that will cut into our shoulder. A set hammer is another option. Again, hold your bar perpendicular to the tool. Make sure the ed edges of your dies are well-rounded. Same as before, switch the sides as you work every two hits. 
address the growth and thickness back to the parent stock thickness. And at this point, we're drawing down to square. So we're just working those two sides until we get that 3 8 of an inch square. Uh, so let's watch a video of that. I'll just, whoops, I'll pause that right there because you can see really well the difference in um, forging from the top versus forging from the bottom. The force of the hammer blow from above is so much stronger. So be aware of that as you forge. And again, uh, address the uh, back to parent stock thickness. And at this point, we're pretty close to that three eighths of an inch square. And that's what we're aiming for. All right, so once we have a square, we're ready to bring it to octagon. Uh, so we have our three eighths of an inch square, we're taking our square to octagon. At this point, we haven't forged in the thickness of the bar, and we'll do that after we create that octagon. So watching a video of this, we have our square, and we're starting to forge in to create an octagon. And there we have our octagon. At this point, we can start bringing in that thickness and using the square octagon round uh, method. Uh, this video goes a little bit ahead of where I went uh, in my slides. All right, so going to round here. And we're not quite at that 5 16th of an inch thickness. Uh, this is a uh, a matter of uh, repeating square octagon round until you get the desired dimensions. Um, and I would say that um, uh, one way to tell if you're at the right size is to uh, check it against your monkey tool because you know that your monkey tool is the correct size. Okay, so at this point, we're ready to bring our octagon to round. So from octagon, you are now ready to forge all eight sides. Uh, we just saw that uh, in the video, we're using square octagon round and our final dimension should be 5 16th of an inch. Uh, so let's watch a video of um, getting that all the way to the 5 16th of an inch. Uh, so this is where we uh, left off in the last video. We had it at round. We're now going back and forging all um, eight sides again. And you'll note that there's a little bit that's hanging off the end of the uh, uh, tool, and you can go and dress that uh, at the anvil. And you can see that off screen. You can't see it, but it's off screen right there uh, to get that um, two dimension. And that's what we're looking for. We have our 5 16th of an inch, and we're ready to use our monkey tool to clean up that shoulder. Okay, so let's talk about the monkey tool because the monkey tool is a level one tool, but it has some features that are super important. So it's worthwhile to review those features. So first of all, it needs to have an opening that is sized to the tenon you are creating. So in this case, we need a 5 16th of an inch hole. That hole should be very well chamfered, well rounded. That is so that nothing sharp is cutting into our shoulder. That's what creates that little chamfer at the end, at the root of our tenon there. Uh, so get in there uh, with a file, with sandpaper, with a Dremel, whatever works for you to get that rounded. Also, your monkey tool should have a very slight convexity to it. This creates a very slight concavity uh, to our tenon. And the reason for this is to ensure a good fit of our tenon, our bar, to our mortise. And uh, I have a picture later that shows this really well. Next, we want to make sure that the depth of our monkey tool is longer than the length of our tenon. If the tenon um, hits up against the end of this, it will upset right into the monkey tool and you can't get it back out. So don't do that. Okay, so how does the monkey tool work? It upsets the material into the shoulder. It's what creates our square shoulder. We put it on the edge of our anvil uh, so that the part we hit with the hammer is just off the edge of the anvil. We put our bar into the monkey tool. We keep it absolutely straight in the tool so it's not bending. 
And this is an upsetting maneuver. So again, we want to take a somewhat isolated heat to just that shoulder and tenon. If we have heat too far down the bar, then we'll end up bending our bar and not really upsetting that shoulder. Once we've upset the uh, shoulder to uh, where we want it, go ahead and dress the sides, file with a hot rasp as, e as needed and chamfer those edges. Um, okay, so let's watch a video of that. And um, all right, I, uh, at this point, we're, we're dressing the area that we upset to um, bring that back to our shoulders. Uh, then we're putting the bar in our monkey tool um, and hitting back towards us uh, to upset that shoulder. And I would note that it takes two, three times through the monkey tool to get this, um, to get that clean square shoulder. Um, if you do have a bend in the bar, take that out with your hammer. Um, straighten everything up, dress the sides, make sure everything's the way you want it to look. So this is almost there, but it has a little bit of a curve. So uh, we're gonna go through this again. Um, and I'll note here that um, uh, I will talk about this later, um, about moving the tenon uh, if it's not in the center. Um, so if it's not in the center, this is a good time to move it back to center and then continue monkeying. All right, and then just cleaning that up. And you can see the root of the, the tenon. Um, that's something like an eighth of an inch there for this size bar. So we really are upsetting a significant amount uh, with our monkey tool. And that's a function of how rounded our tools were. Uh, last step is this is a good time to come in and uh, uh, take off the edges, uh, chamfer those corners. Um, okay, so that is the monkeying. Okay, so here's a photo. Note the concavity of the shoulder after monkeying. And again, this is to help us create a good fit. If the root of the tenon is higher than the shoulders, uh, you'll never get a good fit. You'll, you're, you'll have some rocking in there. This helps compensate for that by putting the shoulders just above that root. Okay, let's look inside the monkey tool to see what's going on here. Uh, so a slight chamfer at the end of the monkey tool helps prevent cracks. So you can see here, this is that chamfered inside edge of that monkey tool. And that means that nothing sharp is ever hitting our shoulder. That is a critical point of your monkey tool. How does the monkey tool work? It pushes, upsets the material into the shoulder. So here you see we have those rounded dies. Uh, the, the marks left by the rounded dies and what the monkey tool is doing is pushing it into the shoulder, upsetting it to create that clean square shoulder. All right, this is about to go terribly wrong. So remember that sharp hardy butcher. Um, and then you can see we came in with a, a secondary tool there to draw out the tenon and that left a hump of material that will fold over when we go to monkey it. Uh, so don't do this. All right, so what else can go wrong? So we talked a lot about cold shuts and cracks. And so just to review that, so uh, hot rasp out any misaligned or double cuts or any marks, those do go deeper as you continue to butcher and draw out your tenon. Ensure all your tools have rounded edges. Don't forge at a black heat. This maybe goes without saying, but sometimes you're working on, you know, forging the end of the bar and you haven't noticed that the, um, the part right at the root of the tenon is at black heat and inertia can cause it to crack. Uh, so keep an eye on that. Chamfer the end of your monkey tool. Okay, uh, what if your tenon is off center? Or alternatively, uh, what if your mortise is off center? We need to punch our mortise for the level two and uh, we all know that none of us are perfect and so sometimes we get our mortises off center. So uh, what do we do in that case? So I will show you how to create off center tenon on purpose in case you need to do that. Alternatively, if it's off center, I will show you how to fix it. To prevent it, flip and rotate your stock frequently. Remember the physics of the hammer blow from above is stronger than the force from below. Hold your stock perpendicular to your tool or use a stand. 
and uh, if it is off center, forge it back to center. Okay, what if your tenon is too thin? You can't recover from this. Uh, so avoid butchering or forging too deeply in the first place. Sneak up on your final dimension using square octagon round and repeat it until you get to that final dimension. Don't touch the thickness until you've reached your three eighths of an inch octagon in the first place. Check the size of your tenon against your monkey tool as you work. Your monkey tool is the right size. Let's say your mortise is off center and you want to purposely create an off center tenon. Uh, so how do we do that? First on a rounded edge of your anvil or a hardy block using half face blows, offset the end of the bar. Then go through the process of butchering in the shoulder and drawing out to square. You'll note that our tenon is now off center. The shoulder on the top is wider than the shoulder on the bottom. If this is on purpose, you can then go through the process of finishing the tenon and your um, off-center tenon will align with your off-center mortise. If that is not what you wanted, then we'll show you how to get it back to where you need it to be. So let's watch a video of this. All right, uh, so using a well-rounded uh, hardy block here. Uh, make sure to keep your parent stock thickness offsetting. Uh, the end there, and then you're going to go through the process of butchering and drawing out just like we did uh, with creating the tenon. Uh, remember to hold it perpendicular, use well-rounded dies, and flip every two hits. Dress it back to parent stock thickness uh, as you go, and you can see here that this tenon is indeed going to be off-center. Uh, the shoulder on the bottom is um, wider than the top. Uh, dress that back to parent stock thickness. Yep, there we go. All right. All right, at this point, switch your tools and draw it out to square. And again, flipping your stock every two hits. And at this point, this is easy to fix, to get it back to uh, center. Uh, if you would like it to be off center, you can go ahead and complete the tenon. Okay, so how do we fix it? So uh, again, find rounded edge of your anvil or hardy block and line it up with the bottom shoulder and then give it a good whack on the top. And let's look over here at what happened. So you can see that the tenon moved up. It's now in the center that top corner sharpen considerably. This is another reason to use those rounded tools because it gives us the flexibility to do that. Um, if we had done that with a sharp corner, that corner had the potential to crack, but this one won't. It causes the end of this to uh, pop up. So we want to realign that with our hammer. And as you can see here, our tenon is now centered. Okay, so let's watch a video of that. All right, good whack, realign it, take a look at if it's in the center, move it a little bit more as necessary, and there you have it. The tenon is now back in the center and you can go through the process of uh, completing it. Okay, so what about the mortise? So our mortise needs to match the shape and diameter of the tenon. For level two, for the level two grill, it needs to be punched and drifted, but technically a mortise can be punched and drifted or it can be drilled. And there's pros and cons to each. Drilling a hole removes material. Punching and drifting gives a more blacksmithy look. It doesn't remove material. It pushes out the material. Um, so depending on what you want it for, you can choose between drilling or punching and drifting. But for level two, you do need to punch and drift the holes on the grill. You'll want to chamfer your mortise to match the chamfer at the base of your tenon. Remember that uh, we have that little chamfer from the monkey tool. So you can come in with a ball punch to create that, uh, but it does need to match the tenon. Otherwise the tenon won't sit flush against the, uh, the mortise. 
Okay, for a flush tenon, you also want to countersink the mortise on the other side for a secure joint. Uh, you need a kind of V shape for that tenon to upset into. If rotation is an issue, consider a square mortise and tenon. This is not required for level two, but if you were making something, for example, a boot scraper comes to mind where you don't want it to rotate, you could have one side be a square mortise and tenon, and that will keep it from rotating. And you only really need to do one side for that to work to stop that rotation. Okay, so putting the mortise and tenon together, looking at some problems. Okay, so what's going on here? We have our bars don't line up. I happen to know I drilled this hole off center, so that's what's going on here. So you would either need to move that tenon or re-drill or re punch and drift your, your hole. Actually, if that this was punched and drifts, it probably wouldn't be as much of a problem. So the other thing that can be going on is if you upset the bar more than necessary and you need to draw that out a little bit or file it back. And that can also cause an overhang. Okay, so second problem is there's a gap here. And okay, I know what's going on in this one because I did it. I didn't upset the shoulder enough. Uh, so the root of my tenon is higher than my shoulder. So I need to go back and monkey this some more if you haven't monkeyed far enough. Um, also make sure that your monkey tool is the at least as wide as the width of your bar which is a problem that I've seen students come across. Okay, so this is what it should look like. Everything should line up. And then we are ready to figure out what length we want our tenon and go ahead and head it. Okay, so uh, how do we size our tenon? So up until now, we've kept our tenon long and now we're ready to size it. So if you would like a round style rivet head, the calculation is the thickness of what you are going through, in this case, the level two frame plus 1.5 times the diameter of the tenon. Depending on how rounded or how much material you'd like your head to have, you might want a little bit more, maybe not a little bit less than 1.5. Um, I think 1.5 to about 1.7 tends to work well for a rounded rivet head. Once you go beyond 1.7, it starts to get tough to keep it straight. And what you have is that as you're upsetting, the tenon, it tends to upset not in the center. Uh, so once you get past that 1.7, it gets a little more difficult to do that. For a flush style rivet, the calculation is the thickness of what we're going through plus approximately one times the diameter of the tenon. And again, this is approximate. You'll have to try this out yourself. And it's something of a function of how big your countersink is that you're upsetting that into. Okay, so heading tenons. Uh, it's important to figure out how to secure your pieces. And depending on what you're making, you can use a vise, uh, you can use clamps, bungee cords. You could, I don't know if you remember, but in an earlier photo, uh, you could thread the end of your tenon and use a uh, wing nut to hold everything together. I've seen zip ties as another way to hold things together. And again, it all depends on what you're making. For the level two grill, what I found works is dragging the vise over next to your anvil and clamping one side and hitting the tenon on the other side tends to work well if you have a setup to do that. Work vertically if possible. Working vertically helps keep everything straight. If you, um, for the level two grill, this should, should be something that you can do. Support whatever you're working on with some sort of solid mass. So anvil is good for that. If not an anvil or a metal table, something that has some solid mass um, below whatever you're working on. So the way that mortise and tenon joints work, the reason that they're so stable is that the tenon shrinks as it cools and forms a really tight fit. But that means that we only want to heat the shoulder and the tenon when we do this. We don't want to heat our mortise. We want our mortise to stay cool. So this puts us in a bit of a conundrum of how to heat this without heating the mortise. Uh, if you have something that has two pieces, you could stick one piece in the forge and then assemble it quickly and head your tenon. But once you start getting into something that has more than one piece, like the level two grill, that becomes more difficult. So this is where oxyacetylene uh, works well. Uh, and if you don't have access to that, the map gas also works for the 5 16th diameter tenons. 
use a light hammer and light rapid blows. Heading a tenon is an upsetting maneuver. Just like all upsetting, we want a light hammer and light rapid blows. Uh, ball peen hammer works well. Reheat as required as you head that. Okay, so let's review. Punch and drift or drill your mortise. Countersink as necessary. Punch and drift so that the put so that your tenon is going through the flat side of what you've just punched and drifts drifted. Measure and cut your tenon to the correct size. Figure out how to secure your pieces. Heat your tenon. Use a light hammer and light rapid hammer blows to form the head. Reheat as required. And as tenon cools, it will shrink and pull the joint tight. Uh, consider practicing first. Last order of business is how do you make a smush matic So you can order guillotines or a smush matic online. If you would like to make your own, you start with one and a quarter inch square tubing. The tubing has a seam down the middle, so you'll want to file that out with a file. You need one inch square bar. This can be mild steel, this is consumable. For the dies, taper the end so you have room for mushrooming. And you'll need the, uh, a, a set of flat dies and a set of angles. You need a washer. What's the washer for? The washer gets welded onto the bottom. This allows for scale to get out. Uh, there's a surprising amount of scale that gets stuck in there. It also provides a nice little opening to push out that bottom die in case it gets stuck in there. Angle iron. This is goes here on the side and you pick angle iron that fits your hardy hole or that you can file to fit your hardy hole and then line this all up. This is a spacer to hold it. You want enough space that you can get your tenon in there, um, as well as uh, you don't wanna nick the shoulder of your bar. So whatever the largest size bar that you're working with, plus some extra. Also, you wanna have enough space that you can get that bottom die out and then weld everything together. Okay, so that is how to make your own smush That is the end of my presentation. Thanks for following along. The next lesson in the National Curriculum Level 2 series covers forge welding by way of a basket-handled fire poker with Victoria Ritter.